and that's what also turns on the transcriptions that you can keep on or off on the right. And um, thank you, Leah and Maggie, talking about scoping reviews. All right, thank you everyone for joining us for this presentation. Scoping reviews have become of such interest and so popular in the past few years that we thought it might be a good idea to just give an introduction to this project type, just a, an overview of things. So I'm here to give a health sciences librarian perspective and my coworker Maggie Murphy is here to give some other perspectives too. So my name is Leah Leininger. I am a liaison to the School of Nursing, the Genetic Counseling Program, and I see someone from that area joined us. Hello. And also Nutrition, Communication, Sciences, and Disorders. Oh, Maggie, you might be muted. There we go. Um, <laughs> I'm in the habit of muting myself when I'm not talking, but then I forget to unmute myself. Um, uh, hi, I'm Maggie Murphy. I use she or they pronouns. Uh, I am the art and design librarian um, and also a uh, liaison to several humanities disciplines, um, liaison or co-liaison, uh, including um, history, media studies, uh, philosophy, religious studies, um, and I'm sure something else that I'm forgetting right now because I'm nervous uh, <laughs> because we're doing a webinar. Um, but so, uh, uh, I've generally been a humanities librarian for several years um, and also work uh, with um, colleagues uh, in kind of uh, interdisciplinary overlaps between humanities and social sciences. Um, and so hopefully I can help provide perspective on that today. All right, thank you so much. So we're going to give some examples of scoping reviews, just excerpts, just to kind of warm up and and get you in that frame of mind Then we're going to talk about comparisons a little bit and guidelines and uh, then we're going to just have a little activity after that. So a description, one of the descriptions that you will read about scoping reviews is that it maps the literature on a topic. It might aim to outline the key concepts or the key theories, maybe the key sources of evidence or the gaps in knowledge on a topic. There are some other things that scoping reviews can do, um, but this is really one of the biggies. Or these are several of the biggies that you might choose if you're interested in scoping reviews. So here's an example, creativity and art therapies to promote healthy aging. Um, a scoping review. So in the health sciences, um, one of the reporting guidelines that a lot of people use asks people to put the type of review in the title. So you'll see a scoping review in a lot of titles of these. So one of the things to think about if you're going to be um, mapping the literature or looking at knowledge and gaps is your question. This type of review, it's for really broad questions. So in what ways do art therapies promote healthy aging is one of the questions that this team looked at. Uh, and they did specify what methodology they used. So they based their approach for their review project on an article by Arxie and O'Malley from 2005. So if anybody's looked at scoping reviews before, this citation might sound a little familiar. Um, these were some social scientists and they laid out a really nice framework for looking at the literature on a topic and um, how to really delve into it. Uh, Galassi et al. searched a lot of different databases. So it's, um, well, a lot. I listed the ones that they searched here. Uh, the ones I was I was pleased to see um, they covered the bases logically. You know, you get your biomedical with PubMed, you get a psychology database, you get CINAHL. Um, One thing I do have a reaction as a librarian sometimes if somebody says I'm going to do this specific type of review. Um, sometimes I'll look back at whatever guidelines and source they mention. For instance, ARCC and O'Malley mention additional ways to explore the literature and to discover sources. So. They did, Arxie and O'Malley did talk about taking other steps, such as maybe looking at the reference lists for the most important articles and seeing if those were useful. Any good things there? Um, maybe hand searching key journals or taking a different step. This is, I don't want to sound like I'm judging this scoping review. It's just, um, you can see, or I'll just say it out loud, 
they found a lot of sources to work with. They gathered a lot of data. They ended up finding um, 1,422 articles that they screened. So that's a lot of stuff for this team to go through. Um, it's just sometimes for the reproducibility and the rigor and all of that, I really love to see like, hey, these are the, this is the methodology that was followed. And, you know, we took these steps and I tend to focus on the searching aspect of it because that's one of the areas that I um, advise on as a librarian. So anywho, I like what they, I like where they looked. Um, another thing with uh, the scoping reviews is of course, presenting the results that you find. Um, if you find thousands and thousands of results, of course, you're not going to read the full text of every single one of those. That wouldn't make sense. So usually there's a screening step. You know, you you have multiple members of your team just skim the, the articles and titles. And sometimes the way this is reported out is with uh, this flow diagram that I took a snapshot of. It's in the uh, upper right hand corner there. Um, and so you can see that this particular team, yes, they found a lot of articles, but don't worry, they're okay. Um, they didn't actually look at the full text of all those. They went through steps of screening and seeing, did these match um, the criteria that they had picked um, before they actually went through and tried to retrieve full text. And they did all kinds of interesting things with the group of articles that they ended up accepting and reviewing for their project. Um, one of the uh, visualizations that they made was just a chart of themes that were found in the articles with, so for the readers, this is kind of like a dream come true because you want your map of the literature. You want to know what themes are out there. And this group, they gave references for all the main themes that they found. It's really nice as a kind of a wayfinding article. Um, um, and so, I'll just jump in and say, um, to me, that's one of the marks of a good scoping review is that the visualizations help the reader um, understand uh, not just the methodology, um, but also um, the findings. Um, uh, we did look at a couple of scoping reviews that were mainly just text. It was all kind of narratively explained. And because it is both, uh, the methodology is um, uh, usually step-based and involves narrowing down from a bunch of articles, it's helpful to just have that as a visual. Um, uh, so I appreciate that when it is included like this one. Good point. So I'm just going to pause here for a moment because I know I'm getting super, I'm really geeking out over this example. So anybody who's in the room, do you have reactions to things that I've said or to seeing just excerpts from this example as a researcher or I don't know? Uh, this is Erica. I just had a question on the slide. So mm -hmm. when it says the approach based in parentheses, no mining reference list or hand searching key journal. So so mm -hmm. in this in this approach, they did not go through and look at references that were. I guess what's mining reference list? Because I was thinking it was like when you do have a journal article that you're considering that you mm -hmm. will also double check the references in that. In the of that in that article you've you you have that idea exactly correct so um approach based on is referring to like this team when they were planning out their review project like what steps were they going to take uh how many databases were they going to search maybe or were they going to do things other than database searches to find out about literature um Overall, what stages were they going to include in their process? That was based on RxC and O'Malley. And the databases search, that's me. I just pulled that from the article. Um, and I just gave a list of, hey, here are the places that these um, researchers search, this research team searched. And the very, the parentheses, that's me being persnickety. So, mm -hmm. I, which I can be about these review types sometimes. Um, it is... It is very logical when you're trying to do like a, a thorough review and you find a really useful article to see what sources did they use in their references list. That is reference mining. Is There are lots of words for it. Yeah. I say, and uh, to take a step back, we will see, uh, so we have a bunch of different examples. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so each of them were, were chosen, not just to show you a range of fields and research questions, but also if you look at the articles, you'll see um, the uh, extent to which they attempt to do like a comprehensive 
um, review of the literature by, again, engaging in some of these other techniques um, widely varies because the scoping review methodology is adaptable. Um, and so, uh, so it, it's about, you know, documenting what method you did choose so that, you know, um, there's kind of internal validation of the results. Um, but, uh, but there will be like variation, um, uh, between the different types of scoping reviews. Um, and that is kind of one of the points about this methodology is that, um, it is maybe more flexible and it's kind of inherently flexible because it is about identifying the boundaries around, you know, a field or a question, identifying gaps, et cetera, um, and less about documenting every single, <laughs> um, article, um, uh, related to a topic, I think. And um, also, and we have, we do have one more hand raised also, uh, mm -hmm. Rachel. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was curious, um, you know, you, Maggie, you referenced that you were going to go over different examples, and I was wondering if you're going to share other approaches other than the Arsky and O'Malley approach, um, so that, and, and maybe what approaches are more suitable for certain types of questions or certain topic areas? Yes, that's an excellent question. So, there are slides later on. I don't know if anybody wants to reshare the link to the slides. For anybody who wants to look ahead to see the plan content, please do. Um, this is meant to be, you know, a 30 minute webinar and and this is very broad looking at a lot of subject areas. So, um, yes, there is going to be a slide that pulls from the Joanna Briggs Institute um, manual. So, uh, yeah, it there is another one, but it. This in this webinar, we're not going to drill down to the detail of this is the type of question you have. Therefore, this is the type of review or the type of methodology for this type of review that you should choose. Um, uh, I generally we do have a decision tree. I think that's going to be a lot of fun, but <laughs> definitely um, if you want to have a, a consultation with me, Rachel, you're one of my folks. Um, we should talk sometime and I will put in another comment I've heard sometimes from a couple of questions from people in genetic counseling about um, specific types of reviews, like scoping reviews. I would be happy to, I'm gonna draw on that a little bit as I discuss too. So yeah, I'll try not to get pulled off, pulled down into the weeds too much. I definitely led that charge. I took us down all those rabbit holes. Um, but yeah, we will have slides that give some general information in a little bit. So I'm just going to eat this very um, high level this time. I'll try. I'll try. Um, here's an example of a scoping review of the impact on children of the built environment. Again, their question's very broad. What impacts on children have been documented? Okay, it's not, it's not saying like the effect of lighting on mood. No, it's just very broad. And they did search a good number of databases, and uh, I listed a few of them here. I'm impressed they included Google Scholar. I think it's great that they were reasonable about it, and they stated very clearly uh, where they stopped. They did, uh, in the charting of their results, um, they did use that flow diagram, which is wonderful. I love seeing that. And they also used, um, of course, something that happens a lot in the scoping reviews in the health sciences domain will be a table that lists the studies that were accepted for inclusion. Uh, and I think it's important to point out that in this case, the authors have their table uh, that, that definitely includes, you can see that they included review studies. So it wasn't just primary reports of research. We're only accepting like quantitative primary reports of research or this type of research or that even. They included reviews as well, which is interesting and I think extremely relevant for scoping reviews where you are in some cases, in this case for sure, trying to map out the literature for others, trying to be kind of a wayfinder. Um, very last one on the health sciences exposure to outdoor air pollution and its human out, uh, health outcomes. So this is an example that was based on that JBI manual. Um, this is like the best one out of all the ones that we reviewed for this session. I was so impressed. They did a lot of searching. Um, after they had done the searching, they identified some um, 
key journals that were very prolific in their topic, and they actually did some manual reviewing of those journals. Um, they did look at the references lists uh, of articles, and they even traced citations. So I thought their visualization, they had a lot of visualizations. I thought this one was very interesting. So they not only had a chart where they showed um, out of the 799 articles that they included, that they actually full text reviewed, um, they not only had sort of a very clear um, chart of these results, they made a word cloud of it. So it's it was enjoyable to read and, and useful too. So I'm gonna pass it along to Maggie. <laughs> Okay, so um, so when we talked about the uh, the sort of health sciences versus multidisciplinary perspectives, one of the things that I think is helpful to think about in terms of um, the the goal or purpose of a review uh, in some other fields um, is not necessarily to result in um, Decision making, you know, uh, uh, that impacts, you know, a population. <laughs> um, so uh, reviews in health sciences often are are meant to inform care decisions, policy, you know, and things like that. Um, whereas in some of the other um, fields, particularly in the humanities, they are um, using a methodology that is maybe more or less built for another purpose um, as an exploratory framework to understand, you know, a subfield um, or a theory or a concept better. Uh, in teacher education, that you know, this is about, um, uh, this one is about, in fact, let me pull up my notes. Um, their research question is, how are playful teaching approaches described and investigated in the literature on the education of future teachers and preschool teachers, including the interplay between the teaching approach and the academic learning goals. Um, so uh, they don't um, say what they want to do <laughs> with finding this out, right? The goal is merely um, to uh, figure out the state of the literature um, on this uh, idea of, of play um, in teacher education. Um, uh, and so this one I highlighted, um, they do reference uh, the sort of, and we're going to talk about, we have a slide about Arxi and O'Malley later, um, but Arxi and O'Malley uh, identify like a, a five stage framework for scoping reviews, um, but how you accomplish each of those <laughs> stages um, uh, is something that um, might vary depending on the field. Um, uh, and so um, the next example that I have, uh, let's see, um, this is uh, an example from media studies, um, and I would say also at the intersection of women's gender uh, and sexuality studies. Um, and so uh, this one, um, uh, their question is, how does the existing literature define uh, online or gendered online abuse um, and what recommendations are proposed to tackle it? And here um, I uh, have on the slide, the graphic kind of showing um, uh, their findings, um, but also uh, they do have the, I'm putting this in the chat, um, they're um, kind of uh, starting, they started with close to 4,000 articles and they only included 61 studies in their final analysis. Um, so they, they scoped that quite sharply towards the end um, uh, in this uh, review. Um, uh, so the next example, um, so this comes from uh, museum studies, which also would overlap with public history. Um, and uh, their question is so broad, <laughs> when, where, and how has play applied and research, uh, I, I might have typed that in wrong because this doesn't even make sense, uh, been applied and, no, okay, and researched in museums. Uh, when, where, and how has play been applied and researched in museums? Um, all museums. Uh, and so um, uh, this study also um, uh, identifies uh, Arxia and O'Malley as their kind of guiding framework. Um, and here uh, I included some of the tables of their results rather than of their methodology. Um, so you can see that they are um, looking at different museum types, um, uh, the fields from which the studies were published, uh, and so on. So they were including um, uh, perspectives outside of 
museum studies, um, including human computer interaction, which is what HCI, HCI is, education, psychology, um, and so on. Uh, and then finally, um, we have a, an example at the intersection of uh, geography and environmental studies and computer science. Um, so this one is interesting in that they don't actually articulate a question anywhere in the paper. Um, so uh, I uh, distilled uh, what I think their question is, which is what are the key domains and uh, approaches, algorithms, and spatial data, data sets employed in the literature on machine learning applications within urban analysis? How do they align with the diverse needs of researchers across different urban domains? Um, so basically this is a review of machine learning methodologies, which I think is interesting, um, uh, like a review of the literature on methodologies. Um, and this was uh, the only review of my four where they um, they cite a different, uh, um, what they're calling conventional, uh, the, the conventional framework for scoping reviews. So it could be that this Peter said et al, um, 2015, um, is maybe conventional for scoping reviews either in, you know, geography, uh, urban studies, computer science. Um, I'm not super familiar with it, but it does show, um, I can't remember who asked earlier um, about examples, maybe Rachel, um, that uh, Arxene O'Malley isn't the only kind of methodological framework that is cited in the literature. Um, and I think that's it for me, Leah. All right, thanks. So we're going to uh, look a little more at comparisons and methodology. So one of the things uh, that I like to do if somebody contacts me and they say, hey, I'd like some advice on a scoping review or I plan to do a review um, is I will either send or refer them respectfully if I, if I can. So it's not too like too many questions, too many actions. Um, here's a decision tree. There are a couple of decision trees out there that are very helpful. This is one that we like. Uh, uh oh, can you hear me? Oh no, I can I can hear you. Your visual is frozen, but I can hear you. Okay, okay. So I'm just gonna go on with the audio. Yeah, maybe um, turn off your camera. Good call. Um, if I completely blank out, Maggie, you're across the room from me. Yeah. Like dash across the room and like knock on my door to come get okay. me. <laughs> but okay. So video only. These decision trees are very helpful. And at the outset, one of the things that I um, advise people to think about is the resources at their disposal. How big is your team? Um, uh, of course, how much time do you have? And yes, what type of question do you have? Do you want to use guidelines? In the health sciences, I read one source that talked about 60 some different types of review. So there are a lot of reviews out there just you know, in some of the subject areas that we're talking about. So decision trees can be helpful. And a few of the types of review are listed on this one. And I'd be happy to, um, your I or your librarian would be happy to point you to a decision tree if we're trying to come up with a review that fits your question. This page is uh, just a comparison between scoping reviews and systematic reviews. So you know, in the health sciences, you're wanting to describe and assess the scope of the knowledge or literature on a topic. And as Maggie mentioned earlier, these do tend to inform healthcare or health policy. So reproducibility is huge. Can somebody else do the searching is what I think of it in terms of um, reproduce the searching uh, and other methods. Um, and of course, uh, pre-existing guidelines are a step towards that. Um, and we're focusing on scoping reviews today. So I'm just gonna go down this a little bit. Yes, there are different um, methodology, there are, I don't know how to say this, there are different approaches uh, that are used in different subject areas. That is very true. A lot of them harken back to RxD and O'Malley. One that is, um, kept updated and that I like, it's extremely rigorous, is uh, JBI, the Joanna Briggs Institute. They have a manual on evidence syntheses with a chapter on um, scoping reviews. I feel like it's very helpful to look at that chapter before I meet with somebody who wants to discuss a scoping review. Um, but definitely you can 
check sources for your own subject area. Maybe look at what journals are publishing. You know, do the journal editors have guidelines or expectations? Like, please use this, please use that. I know in many cases, journal editors will say, use Prisma. Prisma is for reporting, so keep that in mind. Um, so uh, it is used for reporting many different projects, uh, but what I'm talking about is a methodology for other stages of the project. So this is an example from uh, Arx and O'Malley. I am so sorry. I thought that I had pulled more from JBI, but I think okay. the example I took was Arx and O'Malley. So apologies for that. Thank you for putting that link in uh, to the to the JBI manual. Um, it uh, so there are stages overall to the project, but you don't have to do them. Uh, one and done. You don't have to do stage one, it's over. You never revisit it. Stage two, you're locked into it. Stage Leah, three. I, we're actually still on the decision tree slide. Are you, did oh, you move on? Because if so, we're not seeing that. Do you want? I Could you, I will stop sharing. Yeah, I'll share the slides. Yep. Thanks. I definitely moved on. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Teams. So yeah, we didn't, um, we didn't see the table compared to systematic reviews either. And I'm sorry okay. for not catching that. Um, no. I think it was, uh, that I, um, because the, the decision tree also has systematic reviews. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, so I, am I? Are you able to? Yeah, so I'm sharing and you see me advancing through the slides, sorry. Um, oh, teams. Say. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also um, less comfortable with PowerPoint, so that's my fault. Um, okay, so this, this, so we didn't actually look at this comparison. Um, Okay. when you were talking about the difference between um, scoping and systematic reviews. Um, and uh, one of the things, <laughs> yeah, it's a good one, Sam. Um, one, of the, one of the things uh, just um, to keep in mind, you know, for all of these reviews, and again, this is more guidance for um, the fields where um, different uh, kinds of reviews beyond a narrative literature review are less common, is that they are, team uh team activities um they are team the, the team-based research um so if you are um one person uh the leah's on her way to my office sorry um uh that um it's unlikely that you will alone be able to do a scoping review especially because um a lot of the process involves um collaboration. <laughs> here we go no, we're good. Leah's gonna sit here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I, whoa. Hey, that's an exciting chair. Okay. <laughs> um, hey, y'all. So I know we're coming up on 30 minutes. I hope y'all are y'all are cool with going for a few minutes over. I'll keep it rapid, I swear. And I apologize for the tech problems. Um scoping reviews framework. Um so yeah. This is, this is actually pulled from RxC and O'Malley. One, you identify your research question. Two, you select your um, relevant studies or you identify the studies. So that means like the searching and the exploration. Three, uh, you select your studies. And a lot of times you start discovering like, whoa, there's so much here, or this is irrelevant, or this is, you know, we wanna go in a different direction. You can revisit, you can, um, you know, change your question a little bit. You can change your criteria. This framework uh, and the scoping review methodology, methodology is flexible on purpose. Stage four is charting the data. And it's like I mentioned earlier, uh, different uh, subject areas might have uh, different approaches to doing this. In health sciences, a lot of times it's gonna be one of those diagrams that shows how many results you got, but also like a table that lists, these are the best studies that, that we really wanna, review full text. And what I really love is when there are some uh, visuals of the results from those studies and that sort of thing. There is, um, of course, your your narrative um, kind of, we're just gonna write about uh, the results a little bit and an optional consultation. So Arx and O'Malley talks, talk about this and JBI also talks about this. So you might want to consult with um, Key, key agencies or policymakers, you 
might want to take your results to other researchers. You might want to take your results to, to um, I don't know how to put this, like people who the population of your study, you know, like, am I missing something? Like, this is what I'm finding. What do you think about it? And that can inform and add to the information that you're gathering. You really do want to uh, be kind of broad and map out the knowledge in this area. And if you do all this work to gather and chart it out and you take that to somebody before you finalize it, then, you know, you can build on it so much more. So search strategy similarly is iterative, okay? Meaning you can adjust, you can go back and repeat. Uh, and this is the this is the part that uh, we pulled from JB, the JBI manual. Um, you want to do just a brief search in two databases that seem relevant. Um, and out of the results of that, you pull the ones that seem the most useful and you look at the terms and the titles, the abstracts. Um, you maybe look for subject headings. Then uh, you build kind of a, it can be a table or it can be some other visualization if you want. It's, it's just a list of terms for each of your concepts. And then you run that against all the databases you plan to include. Um, and reviewing references lists uh, is typically done. And um, depending on your question, you might also need to include unpublished or difficult to locate material. And there's a really nice peer review of a uh, search strategy called Press that some librarians use. So librarians can meet with you to discuss databases and other places to search, uh, search terms using Zotero for citation management. And just to put this out there, I know that we read about Covidence all the time. It's a project management software. I'm sorry, UNCG doesn't have it, but we have excellent, excellent, um, access to free citation management software. We do a lot with a little. Um, we all do. Uh, some things to keep in mind. We might not have firsthand familiarity with the type of review that you want. So uh, part of the part of the consultations um, is just information gathering. What do you want to accomplish? What resources are at your disposal? You know, we can help you come come to that. Um, but also. Uh, don't necessarily assume that a librarian is available to serve as a, a member of your research team. We're flattered if you're interested, but um, we might not have the capacity for that. That's not, we don't have a review service at this institution. And of course, AI is really coming up quite a bit. There are so many tools in development. Uh, we don't have a specific preference. A, yeah, like no, no single tool has kind of risen to like this is the tool that everyone is using um, uh, and and new ones are coming out all the time. So, um, uh, yeah, it's it, as a library, we have not been like we support or even fully understand, you know, a specific tool. Um, I think some of us have played around with Research Rabbit, uh, some of the other ones, um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've heard. I mean, so I heard I was with a group of librarians yesterday talking about AI tools and ethics. Um, and one librarian put it really well. He said, you know, there are lots of systems out there using AI tools that are black boxes. You you don't know what they're doing or how they're doing it, where they've gotten their material from. Um, we want, or as librarians, we're more comfortable with glass boxes, you know, where, where we can have some knowledge of it. So there are tools like Dimensions AI is a free search engine that mm -hmm. I like a lot. I wouldn't necessarily like say, oh, it's AI, like if somebody comes to me and asks, but I mean, it's in the name, it's in the URL. So anyhow, um, the ICMJE, um, just if you haven't heard, if you're in the health sciences, they do say that authors should disclose the use of AI technologies if they're used in their project. So, yeah, in terms of the rec of replicability also of your methodology, I mm -hmm. think because these tools um, are, a lot of them are in beta, you know, they're tweaking their algorithms. Um, they may be able to, uh, you know, kind of um, do a flow chart of what steps were taken at a given time, but someone else may be using what's essentially a completely different algorithm or tool um, if they if they go on to use it instead. I mean, we've got 
a lot of experience in the library world trying to help guide people towards discovering literature, discovering evidence for their research questions. And a lot of what we depend on is, is being able to point to, okay, this is a useful place to search. This is, these are some steps that, you know, include due diligence. Um, and not that, you know, somebody in another institution might not have the same databases, database subscriptions that we have, but you know, PubMed is PubMed, PsycInfo is PsycInfo, and and many institutions have access to them. And uh, even if somebody searching them uh, maybe has one, they might have a set of results, and in six months maybe there will be some new results. Um, there's still this idea that these these systems are kind of known products, as it were. So I don't know. Yeah. That's not to go on that too, yeah. too much, but <laughs> we're gonna get there with AI. I promise y'all, we will. All right, let's see. I'll pull the path up. Okay, people are responding on the Padlet. I just looked. oh great. I don't. I have it up here, but if we don't want to be looking at it on screen, we can also drag it over there. Okay. No, I think it's nice <laughs> using a decision tree. <laughs> I feel like that about decision trees yeah. too. I like that. Uh, GIF, GIF. I don't know what are we yeah. saying now. Um. Yeah, so if y'all have any questions, now is a great time. Um, I just want to thank Leah and Maggie. Uh, y'all handled the tech issues great. I kind of like the visual of y'all to get, you know, <laughs> like yeah, actually, you're sorry. literally you're working together. In um, I did take a COVID test yesterday morning, so I, I, I mean, I, I routinely take them. It was yeah. a routine test. Yeah. Um, yeah. My um, uh, farmer's market gives them out still. The oh, corner, nice. Uh, the corner farmer's market in Lonely Park. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, you're getting a lot of, uh, you know, applause. Um, a lot of the librarians are saying, great job. I know this is something that, again, as librarians, um, we, we help with a lot. Um, I said in the chat, the um, I've been getting press requests lately, which I, I that's a new thing for me in the last, like, I would say year. Um, and I find that framework like a good way to review your search strategy. So, yeah, I, I also think um, in terms of types of research in the humanities, um, we often have the question of like, is this a thing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, thing? and that's basically what a scoping review is, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like it's a, a methodology that even if you think of your work as being based in primary analysis of various texts, et cetera, um, would still be an interesting uh, approach to research, um, uh, you know, in literature, in art, things like that. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so we're seeing a, a lot of love uh, about um, charts <laughs> and decision trees in the Padlet. Um, yeah, having an organized process that can be implemented with a team, um, I think is useful. Uh, and I think it is not so, um, this, I feel like the stakes are lower in terms of rigor um, in that this could be something um, that you could involve, you know, undergraduate researchers in, you know, um, uh, particularly when it is not involved in healthcare decision making, but um, as particularly in social science fields, um, uh, things like that, where um, you're exploring a broad open question, what you do with the results um, may just be to know where the boundaries of a field or an idea are um, for the next stage of research. Um, yeah, for the health sciences, I would just jump jump on that and yeah. say, maybe look carefully yeah. at whatever approaches or, or guidelines are in your subject area yeah. because for a lot of the health sciences there they tend to be um team-based projects that can last five months or more yeah. so you know you might if if you are somewhere in the healthcare do science domain you might you know assign like hey students create a protocol yes. or, yeah or you know that's great um a link for the press and is ir on do inter-rater reliability reviews for scoping reviews. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <That's you. laughs> Good question. Yeah. No, you don't. Their scoping reviews do not typically include a step for um, assessing the studies that are included. That's not a part of it. 
Yeah. And I think that that is one of the things where I'm saying like the stakes are lower, you know, like in that um, the, I think the constant validation of the results, mm -hmm. uh, like the internal, you know, internal to the process, I think there's far less of that in a scoping review. Yeah. You think about it, think about it in terms of a, again, I mean, I don't know, like mapping or, or broad overview. If you're having a project that includes qualitative results, quantitative results, and even, you know, review articles and even unpublished literature, like you, it would be really hard to try to, to try to um, assess, you know, reliability and bias and this and that. So that's just not even a thing with most scoping reviews. Um, yeah. And there is a link to press um, in the slides on one of the slides. Yeah, I tried to get it, but I don't under, you know, like I yeah, couldn't do it from my version of the slides. I tried to get the link, but um, we can send it out. Yeah, we'll, we'll send it out because yeah. we have yeah. the list of uh, Sorry. attendees. And actually this meeting chat stays active. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'll I'll send the slides out with the recording. Okay. Um, so yeah, later. when you do that, we'll, we can just isolate out um, something for press. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we didn't really talk about um, in terms of, um, what expectations are from publishers with regard to scoping reviews, you know, what you call a scoping review. Um, but I think uh, they should have some clear documentation on that, right? Look at the, I mean, this sounds like the tail wagging the dog kind yeah. of a situation, but look at where you want to get published. Yeah. What What are their guidelines for authors? What are they saying about these kind, yeah. types of papers? So, Maybe it's yeah, a GBI most... shop, maybe it's a Cochrane shop, maybe it's a, you know, whatever. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. and then one last point that we wanted to make is that you can use parts of this methodology and adapt it into your own, you know, research study, and it doesn't have to be called a scoping review. <laughs> you know, like if you like parts of what this does, um, uh, you, know, you can use them and be flexible about that. And um, I will include one study, uh, I'll send it to Sam, um, where they say, we use parts of, you know, like of a scoping review approach, you know, um, as part of our study, but then they did different kinds of analyses and came to different kinds of um, conclusions than you would with just a scoping review. Right. Um, so, yeah. Well, great. Um, okay. Are there any other questions? Um, and I, I have found this to be very useful. I keep looking at the person hugging the tree in the path. Like, yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> I'm just yeah. 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 Thank you. Some more applause. Um, yeah. So thank you all for coming. Um, thank you again to Maggie and Leah. Um, I will send a follow up email with the recording and links to the slides. And um, I will touch base with Maggie and Leah about anything I might need to pull out of the slides. Totally fine. Um, and yeah. Happy Wednesday. Hump day. Um, yep. Yeah, so, uh, um, you know, if you have questions and we are your liaisons, reach out to us. Um, otherwise, reach out to your liaison with questions. Um, uh, keeping in mind, again, that we are experts on <laughs> researching methodologies, helping you find places to publish, um, et cetera. We may not and probably are unlikely to be able to be on your review team um, just because that is beyond the scope of our uh, purview on this campus due to our size and uh, our, you know, internal levels of support. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, you know, and also I, I always laugh with um, people. I see a lot of my people here, but I'm like, uh, if you want a team, get someone with a medical school <laughs> on your team because they most likely have COVID <laughs> and yeah. then, uh, you know, they could uh, uh, fill in the collection things as well, you know, yeah. so that that you could say the full list if you want it. So yeah. uh, that's the benefit of a team of a review. Yeah, well. pragmatism is pragmatism. I'm like, find those medical schools. Um, okay, well, thanks y'all again. Um, and uh, everyone have a great week and I'll see many of you soon. Bye. Bye. Yeah. I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>